the Medium Gallery, uh, I'm glad that you uh, took the time to uh, visit the last uh, of our lecture from the series New Interfaces, where we uh, invited various uh, art uh, theorists or also psychologists, uh, people from various fields, uh, to talk about the topics that are connected with our uh, presence, uh, which is uh, influenced by various technological changes. Uh, now we have uh, the guest from Vienna, Klaus Steidl, uh, which I'm happy to uh, introduce. Uh, Klaus is art curator and critic. Uh, he studied philosophy uh, at Sorbonne, uh, but he's devoted to contemporary art, uh, which is heart and soul, I think. Uh, I uh, experienced him, uh, his uh, lectures, uh, or kind of guidance. Uh, through art writing uh, in Salzburg at Sommer Academy and I decided to invite him to react also uh, on the topics of uh, the exhibitions which are currently uh, at the Medium Gallery but he will also talk I think about his uh, curatorial uh, activity and uh, I will just thank to the uh, Slovak Art Council that made possible this series to happen and I will uh, give a word to Klaus and uh, it's of course a wonderful lecture. So <laughs> thank you for coming. Thank you, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here in the Academy for the first time. And as you saw, the topic is quite packed and so um, I won't systematically address all these questions. I will be more inspired by, by Wittgenstein, who has been a philosoph philosopher who inspired me quite a bit and who once said that his only natural way of thinking is to jump around the problems. So I have some chapters, I have tried to structure things, but I'll also be jumping around these questions a little bit of storytelling, of traces, also what might be future traces in a digital realm and um, he also said once that philosophy was to bring uh, together memories for a specific aim so I'll try to pull together some some memories and and use those memories to maybe clarify a few things but this theme of especially solastalgia is a theme I just started researching so this is a bit of work in progress I did a PhD on storytelling and um, at the Sorbonne and was very interested as well in how traces tell stories. So also this idea that traces are connected to storytelling, that we, when we see a trace, we very immediately tell ourselves the story of what might have happened. When you come late to dinner, you see all the plates and you're like, okay, they're still clean, right? I'm not so late. So what we do there is basically look at the trace and then see what might have happened before. And I think this is a very universal skill and desire we probably developed when we were still in, in the prehistory because we needed to figure out whether we could sleep somewhere or whether wild animals might come there at night. And so we always read traces and trace based storytelling I think is therefore very powerful. So that's the connection between this question of storytelling where as we often think of storytelling as people interacting, like there was no story if you don't see people. But I think that's not true at all. I think maybe the first storytellers were people who read the trace of an animal on the ground and said this and that happened here. Um, so nostalgia I'll get into more, more deeply later so I won't say much about it but of course once you establish that traces can tell stories then you can also think of landscapes as, as having stories encouraged in them through the traces you find and I think this is the strongest connection to the exhibition that maybe you already saw, if not you, sh you should come back because usually there's a video here which is really beautiful and gives a lot of insights as well as to the other elements but the artist is collecting traces in nature as well. Um, and yeah, so that's basically what I, um, I will be talking about today and how it kind of fits into my own biography. This idea of solastalgia somehow, or maybe also this talk, is supposed to, to help me understand something that happened now maybe eight years ago when I went back to the village where I was born in the south, or not born, but I grew up with in, in the south of Germany, going to the forest where I used to play as a child and where I used to build a wood house and shoot with bow and arrow. 
And I went into this little wood that you can see here uh, and looked what had happened there, if there still were wood houses. And I found this um, wood house. It was not one I had built. As you can see, it's already been destroyed. But what was interesting and what was a little different from what we had in our wood houses was that there were these elements which I didn't quite know how to make sense of. There was this lying on the floor, that, which I still really don't know what it is, and, and also these things that the kids had made for themselves. And I think that one is particularly striking. Do some of you recognize what, what it is? Yeah, um, maybe. Okay, so, so this is, is actually exactly, it's a game controller, right? So, so somehow this troubled me, you know? Now the kids were still playing in the forest, they were still building wood houses, but to furnish it, what they needed was basically Game Boys or props that had some of the affordance of these game controllers. And, you know, I made this image here where you can see how it basically is supposed to look, what, it, what they were dreaming of. And I'm not a technophobic at all, so I, I had a hard time making sense as well of, of this trouble that I felt at seeing that. And I hope that in this talk today, I actually, as I was doing the talk, somehow I had the feeling that maybe in the end I understand it a little better. And so there will be one, one of the, the quests uh, of this talk to figure out why this creates a certain sense of discomfort. Um, landscape, especially painting, but maybe also drawing, I think, um, has nearly since its beginning often aimed at capturing atmospheres. There's even a, a text by Alois Riegel, uh, an art historian, who, who said that Stimmung, ambience, atmosphere, was the content of modern landscape painting. And he says when you're very close in the landscape, you basically uh, only see the details and the actions and the interrelations, but when you go far, you don't see these details anymore and then you can capture the landscape. Hence also this, this desire of having these vast, you know, landscapes in paintings. This is my own attempt when I was drawing um, to capture an ambience. You know, when I was drawing at the time, and this is long ago, uh, my desire was to capture the ambience of, you know, a windy day at Lake Constance, where, uh, where we later moved um, from this small village. And I think this was pretty much, without reflecting it, when I did these things when I was much younger, without reflecting, for me it was clear that what I wanted to do was to capture the moment. And I was hoping to be able to transmit the moment. Of course, this may or may not happen, and I think that's the biggest difficulty artists have to overcome. Because when I look at these images, they still kind of convey the ambience to me. But I was there. So they might just trigger the ambience for me, and I might have the illusion that everybody else also feels the same thing as I do. But maybe they do, maybe they don't. And I think being a better artist than I am is really to be able to make others experience what you maybe want them to experience, or at least an experience that you find valuable as well. So when we put together an exhibition in, in the Dom Museum in Vienna, um, we showed, it was an exhibition around nature called Fragile Creation. We showed, uh, for instance, this painting that's like the, there was the, the catalog of the show and I will be quoting some artworks from this experience. We showed this work by Caspar David Friedrich, which is a romantic painting and of course I arguably one of the things he wants to do there is also to tr tr transmit the ambience and maybe does so more successfully than I do. But these strategies, which are maybe the most obvious ones um, of showing things as you see them might not be the most efficient and most intense ones to capture atmospheres. And one strategy I recently discovered um, is used by Nikolaus Ganstera. Um, he has a project, a research project in the moment that's called Contingent Agencies, where he basically tries um, together with a philosopher to capture the agencies in different spaces. So the agency of the wind, the agency of the sound, of the rain. So they have this idea that their agency is active. Here we have the agency of the flies, for instance, that is active. And you could focus on this agency 
and try to capture it. And this was his attempt to capture the agency of the rain while he was by a lake uh, in Austria. And as you can see, the rain basically became a co-author. So here, I think this is a very, for me, it's a very strong and telling image of a rainy day, even though you don't really see an optical image of the rain, but you see the trace. So here the trace really becomes part of the, the agency of the image making as well. Uh, interfering and intervening and I think it might be a very powerful way of creating you know images of, of atmospheres um, but of course uh, this already shows that that kind of image which we might judge standard is just a choice a specific choice that we're making to show things in a certain way in this case um, a bit blurry but maybe representing a blur and is also a bit for the back, bad representation and the lights. I mean, the, the light is very different on the projector, unfortunately, than, than in the original Caspar David Friedrich. So there's a blurriness, but the blurriness is really fog. And um, what was important to me is also including other kinds of images in these exhibitions that, that might show that the standard image is actually just one choice. And, that always other images could have been possible and I think that's part of what John Hilliard does here, um, an experimental conceptual photographer from England who shows the same castle as it says in the title, unfocused, decayed, so that's the castle in ruins and then blurred by a motion blur. So bringing it home that of course there are many different ways of capturing the world and that the standard image in the middle is just one choice that seems mostly to us a powerful choice but maybe a choice like this can be in certain cases stronger and of course the blur has certain affordances which is a word that, that's used in, in design theory as you might know so it allows for certain things that a, a, a clear image doesn't. The blurry image could be of many different landscapes, right? If I make a, 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 a clear image of you, a photograph, it can only be you but if I make it a bit blurry suddenly the possibilities multiply and it can be many different people. So this is really around how do we create images of landscape, what does it imply to make certain choices. And of course in the digital era we have added some choices, not least the choice to suppress the image, to delete the image and this is Vincent Broquer. The, the picture is titled Beginning a Dialogue, interestingly and you know, what's the dialogue, who's the dialogue with? Nearly the title becomes very co-creative of the, of the idea here. Do we dialogue with the machine? Is this beginning of a dialogue with the machine? And of course what's striking is that he took all the time to make this relatively naturalistic image and then he put this box over it and, and kind of it brings into play the contrast between making a traditional image with all the work that we know goes into it and a digital image that can be made and unmade in basically one, one click. Um, another aspect that's important in relationship to the images of our natural world in particular is that they, I think, create images in our minds. So having seen the world represented in a certain way over and over again will maybe tend to influence how we think the world is. And there's something Nietzsche said um, in On Truth and Life uh, in a non-moral sense. If, however, he says, the very same image is produced millions of times and handed down through many generations, and finally in each case appears to all mankind as the effect of the same cause, then ultimately it acquires the same meaning for man as if it were the only necessary image. Just as a dream, endlessly repeated, would be felt and judged to be thoroughly real. So the way I interpret this in this context is that, you know, having seen a certain kind of image of nature over and over again, it's not just a trace of how people perceive nature, but it also influences how people coming afterwards will look at it. And famously, there's the idea that landscape has been invented, notably invented in landscape painting, that landscape, to appreciate landscape outside in the world only became possible when we extracted ourselves from the toiling, from working the soil, from being part of landscape and contemplating it from a distance. 
So landscape painting that supposedly was born in, in, in Flanders in the 15th century with someone like Patinier, Joachim Patinier, would have become kind of possible through this distance to landscape and then influences how we look at the natural world. So when we see, for instance, this painting by Euge, um, the fall of Icarus from the second half of the 16th century, um, you of course have the trace of someone working, so there's a temporality in this image, right? You can see that this man has been working for a while because he went up and down and you see the, the traces in the soil, so this image somehow brings in a temporality through this person. At that spot there's kind of a, a slow time going on, which is, by the way, an important aspect in this exhibition as well, like what's the temporalities, what's the temporality of a stone, how is the difference from our own temporality. But then there's also a sudden moment, and I don't know if everybody already discovered it, or some of you certainly know the painting. The sudden moment is, is over here, and it takes you a while to discover it. It's as if you vicariously were doing the same thing as the people in the painting. You're missing out. You're missing out on someone who fell into the sea, who's potentially dying. So, for me, what's interesting about this work, also in terms of how it's constructed, is how basically it has not only a temporality of a story that is being told, but it also has a temporality of looking at it, right? It's not a film, but nobody who has never seen that image before will look here first. So this is second for all of you. So the image encodes a certain timeline of reading into it, even though it's a still image. There is something cinematic to that, and Eisenstein spoke of cinematism. He thought that there were some paintings that had cinematographic elements before the cinema was invented, namely montage. But we could also speak about temporality here. And what else it contains is maybe a point of view on our relationship to nature, namely that nature is utterly indifferent to human suffering that if someone dies, everything goes on as it is. And um, Auden, W. H. Auden, took this as an inspiration to write a poem which starts this way. He says, about suffering they were never wrong, the old masters. How well they understood its human position, how it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along. So here someone is looking into the clouds, of course, this guy is working and, and this man is fishing and he's Icarus basically falling down and, and dying here. So it's a certain way of seeing nature as being indifferent to human suffering. But we could say that the humans, you know, have well returned it to nature, uh, being indifferent to nature's suffering. And um, I think that there might also be images that are partially responsible for that. And this might be just one of those images. As you see, it's maybe you, those who have a Christian education might have recognized that this is Adam and Eve in, the, in Eden, basically with a central scene where uh, God forbids Adam and Eve to eat from the fruit. And then you have all the other scenes as well. So you have the creation of Adam, you have the creation of Eve, you have then the, how he forbids them to eat from the fruit. Here they eat from the fruit and then they hide from God, who's present here, and then they're thrown out of uh, Eden. So it's an image that, again, has temporality, but as you can see, in a very different way, because it explicitly tells all the moments in one still image. But what the image conveys nearly without us thinking about it is a certain relationship to nature, I would say, arguably one where nature is a stage for humans to act on. There's no symbiotic relationship here. Humans can use bushes, the bushes have the affordance of allowing us to hide. They're just standing there and everything goes around uh, for us, basically. Um, which might seem very natural, but is actually, of course, cultural. And even looking at an earlier image of the same theme made in early Christianity, uh, sixth century after Christ, namely this image from the Vienna Genesis, you see a very different relationship to nature. Because here basically 
they are really intertwined with nature. You see the tree kind of bowing at the same time. Here you have the tree basically hiding the nakedness. They don't have to hide themselves because the tree interacts with them. It's like they are like trees among trees. The trees are people among people. It's a very different vision, arguably, that is conveyed implicitly by this image, which at the same time tells a story. But of course, we can very easily not be aware of that and kind of miss out on what comes with the image while it actually tells us a story. But maybe what comes with the image subconsciously is more important and has even more impact on the way we see things than the story that's explicitly told. Um, and there's something else that goes into this image um, without us usually questioning it, I believe, is that temporality works in a certain way. That there is a timeline and there's just one element that might fall out of this timeline and that's God. Because this God is basically among people. He's in our timeline or it or she is in our timeline. Here it's a he with a beard. But this one maybe is taken out. Like maybe this is X. This is the omnipresent, omniscient God who's there. So there's linearity and then there's maybe what I have called ionochrony, something that's eternal, which is taken out of this timeline. But what's not there is a different way of seeing time unfold and um, I think we can observe that in this image by the Andoke, which was solicited by an anthropologist working with this tribe that has very little contact with people that are not part of it in the Amazonas in Colombia and she asked them to draw an image of the river in summer for a calendar. And what they drew when she came back was this image. And this is the river, but it's not the river in summer, it's the river throughout the seasons with the fish species that are there, with the trees, with the fruits that come out at the different times and so on and so forth. And she said, ah, but I, I wanted you to ask a, an Im, uh, to draw an image of the river in summers. And, and then I would have asked for one in the winter. And they said, the translator translated into Spanish for her, pero no es así. But that's not the way it is. For them, an image of one moment, which again for us has been naturalized, has been coded into the photographic camera. The moment and then the next moment and then the next moment it's not obvious, for them time is cyclical. It's not like that. It's not like our river exists now. And when you have this image, what you throw into the river, of course, comes back through the river. And I think this way of thinking of time um, also induces a very different relationship to, to nature. So thinking of you as part of nature and these images, you know, include these different ways of seeing But let me bring in this new term, this new concept, uh, at least for me new, even though it, it has been developed about at least 20 years ago, solastalgia. Um, arguably this image, which may at first sight look like a very traditional uh, landscape painting from a painting school that won't be so well known in Europe, it's the Hudson River School, is an image that um, show signs of solastalgia. So you have an image of the, it's by Thomas Cole, the Oxbow, the Connecticut River near Northampton. Thomas Cole counts as the founder of the Hudson River School. And again, the, the image is, here it's much, uh, much more gray, so it's not this strange, nearly nuclear looking you, it's really a, a gray sky, um, just to reestablish the context. But uh, he painted himself into the image, as you can see here. Um, you see him, you see the painter here painting the image. And of course, the site he is on is the site of, you know, still a relatively wild nature. But on the other side, nature has already been, so to say, conquered, if we want to use this, this term. And maybe it's not a bad term in that context. So the trees have been taken out so people could cultivate stuff. And even further in the image, you see, you see that there are paths that have been made in the, in the forest where people have cut down trees. 
And after his death, someone realized that these were Hebrew letters that, if you look at them upside down, mean the al Almighty. So as if, if God was kind of, when, when, when you look at it from God's perspective, you would see the Almighty. And um, Thomas Cole wrote an important essay on the American landscape. He said a lot of people think America is ugly. That's the end of the or middle of the 19th century. A lot of people think America doesn't have all the great mythological stories that Europe has. Uh, we, don't have the, uh, we don't have these great landscapes. Our mountains are not as high as the Alps and so on and so forth. And then he kind of goes into this explaining why America has great landscapes. For us today, it seems uh, obvious a lot of people go to America to American sense of the United States of America for the landscape, but at the time people just found it brutish. And, um, and he said, but this landscape is disappearing. And this is one of the early expressions, usually quoted as one of the early expressions of Solastalgia, where he says, I cannot but express my sorrow that the beauty of such landscapes is quickly passing away. The ravages of the axe are daily increasing. The most noble scenes are made desolate and oftentimes with a wantonness and barbarism scarcely credible in a civilized na nation. This is 1836, so kind of very early case where, where this is being observed. Um, and this brings me to this idea of solastalgia with, of course, a degree of destruction um, displayed here that's, that's even greater from a mine in Australia, in the Hunter Valley, where there's several mines and people have seen their landscape basically disappear for this, for this uh, looking for, for coal, this coal mine. One moment I looked out and I, I just saw this and I was like, hmm, it's maybe also happening just like 10 kilometers from here, the same thing is still happening, you know? So of course this is progress in a way, but it's also, of course, the same destruction of landscape. And then you see the mine just in front of it. And this was probably a landscape dear to someone at one point as well. So this, this kind of feeling, I think, exists in, in all kinds of landscapes. And the way was defined by Glenn Albrecht, an Australian philosopher who was trying to also account for the suffering of the um, Aboriginal populations was to say it's a homelessness or homesickness you have when you're still at home. So that's the difference between nostalgia and solastalgia. The homesickness that you feel when you're still at home. The pain experienced when there's recognition that the place where one resides and that one loves is under immediate assault, physical desolation. It is manifest in an attack on one's sense of place and the erosion of the sense of belonging, identity to a particular place, and the feeling of distress, of psychological desolation about its transformation. And that Thomas Cole was afraid of that, even though for us this might seem like quite little destruction, could be linked to the fact that he came from England, where the famously Industrial Revolution had started and where one of his colleagues painted a relatively romantic painting of Manchester. <laughs> okay, so that's Manchester in 1852. You see it's like a city full of these evaporation towers and the fact that they are like just in a distance and that they don't matter that much might also show a certain way of seeing the world. Usually people say that he wasn't quite, you know, feeling the same way as, as Cole about it, kind of. It was part of his landscape and everything is still, you know, possible and people can still go into nature. But here you really have the separation of a city, which is basically nature gone, and then you have an outside where you can still enjoy nature. And uh, there's a whole vocabulary around uh, nature as a place for enjoyment of, of humans. And another pan in the work of Cole himself was then to project himself back into other times, basically, um, by painting images like that, which is called a wild scene, uh, where you, you see these people wearing basically animal skins, are hunting with bow and arrow, which in a way was 
still close. It was uh, in, in America at the time with the indigenous population, but their clothing makes you think more of prehistory and there was a whole run on prehistory in the end of the 19th century and there were different painters who kind of projected themselves back. So our time is basically this time where we cut down trees, where these things come up and one artistic strategy is like, let me paint these images of a different kind of nature where it still was wild. And uh, some peoples have accounted for the destruction, not just by making images that show destruction, but also nearly destroying the image they were making. And this might be a different way of exodus, maybe linked to a painter who starts to feel that his land goes away politically because it's, you know, under this um, domination of a communist rule in China and then the brush strokes nearly showed the kind of destruction that he's experiencing with this red earth and the red is here maybe something that's in the, in the ground but also maybe just the color that, that's associated with the Communist Party also in, in China at the time. So here we have a trace, but it's not a trace that's being depicted, like in Bruegel. You remember that there were the traces in the ground. It's the trace of the making of the image that contributes to its meaning. So the brush stroke becomes meaningful. The energy and maybe the violence of the brush stroke gives the feeling of you know, a certain violence, even though the scene in and by itself might not have clear traces of violence. So, since this soul nostalgia hit, there have been different ways of dealing with this idea of loss. Uh, and I'm going to look into these artistic strategies for the second part of my talk. One first strategy is creating evidence. So you basically, as an artist, go out and look for evidence and contribute to making it visible. You know, you see yourself as someone who makes something visible, which might be happening on the other side of the globe, which might be happening outside the city, um, or the impact of it on people as well that's invisible. A second strategy is becoming a translator. And I kind of created most of these concepts based on looking at different artworks that seem to deal with this topic in one way or another, um, is to become a translator of nature. Um, and we'll look at that a little bit. A third is imagining future traces, like looking at what things might be left behind. And that was also the title giving principle, the traces we will leave behind. Not necessarily that we're leaving, but that we will leave or will have left behind. A fourth is then going into action, like preserving in one way or another. And the fifth is maybe compensating or trying to heal. So creating evidence, what can that be? One artwork that for me goes in this direction and one artist who's working on that is Ines Duyak with her series on land grabbing, among other things where she displays these images of apple species that have disappeared. And you know, I don't know if you had the same experience, but I was like, oh, there's a new apple species. There's the pink lady now. And there's, you know, uh, I didn't know this apple species from France, the Reine de Renette, and so on. And I thought there were more and more apple species. But the truth is, they're actually less and less. There used to be 90 species of apples, at least, that had been uh, painted and, and cartographed and we are losing this biodiversity in apples. And so she looks at these apple species and she links it to land grabbing. So each of these images has a quotation from a land grabber, which can be as early as uh, the colonial period where people say, well, it's always the same arguments. It's always, we need to take the land away from the natives because they're not using it efficiently, right? And if we take the land away and we make a monoculture, we'll be more efficient and uh, we can feed more people and so on. So, so there's always the same kind of argument and she, in this series, so she shows these apples, but then she always lists a quote by a land grabber. Uh, and by the way, interestingly, there's a quote by Adolf Hitler as well when he took over Ukraine um, or wanted to take over Ukraine to have access to corn. So also as kind of land grabber. And of course, 
we see this uh, again happening uh, today. So creating evidence of things that maybe people are not so aware of. Of course, there are traces also each landscape, even this landscape, which sees, seems relatively untouched, is somehow a trace of geological events, right? So that's just a, a side remark, but there is also each landscape, the landscapes we live in is, is traces of uh, events that took place over millions of years. But another kind of, of trace, also painted by Otto Dix, and that probably created this feeling of loss, is not just uh, destructions of war for people, but also the impact on nature. And for those who saw Andrei Tarkovsky's first full-length movie, um, Ivan's Childhood, it, it's extremely present there. You see these like forests that are basically dead. Um, and it's, it's very, for me, was always a very strong image of the destructions of war, also the effect on, on the natural landscape or these completely new landscapes that are created uh, just basically out of shells, of shelling, um, in this case in, in France, uh, where, where Otto Dix was uh, a soldier at the, at the front with, with France um, in Verdun. And uh, so this is a way to bring these images back and make them visible. This is a contemporary artist. This is again an exhibition view from Fragile Creation. It's Betty Bayer, who basically uses art again to make things visible. Um, in this case, that happen sometimes on the other side of the planet. So this is the impact of climate change. It's an image from Kivalina, and she calls these citizen, um, citizen Bürgerscholle, citizen plank or something like that. So it's basically made with people who live there. They take one square meter that shows the kind of destruction that it went through and then she preserves it and brings it into an exhibition room. Um, this is from China, Xiaolangdi. Kivalina is an island that's actually, sorry, I didn't say that. Kivalina is an island uh, that's disappearing because of climate change. So each year like more and more of the island is, is eaten away basically by the rising sea level and they build these kind of structures to try to preserve a little bit so that's why there's this white they, they, they try to to keep the the sea from eating their their land but of course it keeps happening and going on so this is Kivalina this is the same kind of approach but with a, a, a um, barrage staudam you know, when you s stop water uh, from flowing and then you create this artificial lake, so this kind of approach in China, Xiaolangyi. And, um, and this one is uh, Stuttgart 21, when basically they decided that we had to travel 20 minutes faster to Munich from, you know, Berlin and that therefore we could destroy half of, we could destroy an old park with all its trees and half of Stuttgart and build an underground train station and a lot of people were protesting in this, uh, in this park and were then carried away by the police. And so this is a trace again closer to home. So it's not ev everything is happening of course um, on the other side of the planet in the so-called global south, but there are also combats to be fought closer to home. Similar approach is put into place by Carolina Caicedo and uh, Jonathan Luna, who's an activist in this project, in this video that's called Relapse Bleeding, which is again uh, around the project of a dam. That's the word I was looking for, a dam project. But this case in Colombia, and there are people who live for hundreds of years downstream, living from the fish and everything, and then someone decided to privatize de facto the water by cutting it off. And then everybody who lives downstream has no work anymore, and they are offered to work in the construction of the dam, but of course, once the dam is there, then their livelihood is gone and their relationship with the river is gone. So this Magdalena River that, that is being taken away and again, she's making visible, you know, the actions of multinational corporations that are also active here um, in, you know, other parts of the world. And we'll look at this book a little later. A third project in this direction of contemporary art trying to make visible a loss is a work by Matthias Kessler, 
um, and it's called Nowhere to be Found. And it's based on his experience of diving, where he was basically diving in the reefs and every few years it was more and more desolate. So again, an invisible, basically, extinction that's happening undersea. And now he doesn't go anymore. And his way to, to address this is by creating this image of a human skull that is cultivated by um, um, reef, by a, a, what do you call it? This uh, animal, which we think, which looks like a plant. Um, coral. Coral, thank you. Cultivated by corals. And actually the corals kind of eat from the calcium, so they, they like use up the calcium, but you still need to add a lot of stuff, so there's a big machinery under it. In order to re-establish something that exists in the open as a natural ecosystem, to replicate that, you need like a whole lot of machinery and electronics and, and uh, additions to the water and so on, and so you can see this. And I did this little video in the, in the exhibition because there was also a hermit crab in there. So this is after the exhibition had run for like six months. And this hermit crab of course always needs a new shell because when it grows it like moves shells and needs a bigger shell so there are always bigger shells in there. And it was like, I felt like the hermit crab was looking at the curator from inside the, inside the aquarium with like what looks like blue eyes, but I didn't actually Google it. And that's, so, that's what happened in there. And actually one of the uh, corals was much more efficient than the others and basically took away the light from the one that was growing below. And so, so there was also some kind of like fight and extinction for resources happening during the, the exhibition, but it was really a way to bring into the exhibition space an experience which he uh, had had outside. This is already going somewhere else and you saw this as the opening image. It's a work by Julie Monaco. It looks like real, but it's actually a chemical plate. So it's, there's no object that has been photographed. It's just obtained by a chemical plate, like a, an image of nature, which is kind of a treason because you think it's natural and actually it's man-made. And the same is true of these mountains, which are from Katrin Bolt, which she calls the Nubilin land landscapes because it's plastic bags that she pulls out of the Danube and then forms these artificial natures of. So kind of taking what destroys nature to make a new image of nature. Um, and in the same, and here we have an image of a real ice berg photographed by Matthias Kessler again, but he illuminated it like from a video game. And for him it's around this like thing that in video games, you know, nature is usually a backdrop. It's basically like things happen in front, so they still, most of them still have the same relationship that we had in this uh, painting before, where nature is a stage, where you drive your car, where you shoot people. Um, so this kind of backdrop image of nature, uh, where maybe you can destroy a tree or something because it serves you in the video game. So this like, I think deeply kind of encodes, like all our visual culture contributes to encoding this image of nature as a backdrop that we can just use uh, and that we can do our stuff in. And so he puts that to the fore with, with this image, I suppose. And in a way, um, yeah, here, of course, this for me brought also back this, this experience I had had where these kids are in nature and maybe that's something that's so disturbing to me. These kids are in nature and basically they try to replicate the experience they would have inside their house playing a video game. It's so, it's so important. Maybe it's even a kind of replacement to a certain degree of this experience outside. And I think the reason it troubled me is that I would maybe argue that there is a stola, solastalgia that's not linked to the fact that your environment has been taken away, but that your perception has been taken away. And I experienced that for the very first time when I was about 18. I, I had a cell phone, early cell phone at the time, and I came back to Lake Constance from having worked as a social servant far away. And I walked out of the, of the train station and normally I will like, look at the, at the lake and without realizing it, I had pulled out my phone because I had gotten an SMS 
And I came home, but I was on my phone. And somehow it's something that this experience, which is an experience which has of course multiplied and which has become way worse since I did my, uh, in 2000, my, my social service, my civil service. I think it's also, for me, it was a feeling of loss. And it's a loss that somehow is my fault, right? So it, it makes it worse in a way because you can always tell yourself, I'm not making the minds, right? Of course, it's a bit lying to yourself because you're using the stuff that, you know, is produced. But you can always tell yourself, I'm not making the line. But I'm pulling out my phone, right? So I put myself in the situation where I kind of have this loss of the place where I am um, through being mentally absent. So, yeah, for me, it was a feeling of loss that I still experience. And I'm still trying or I, I try again to break up with my phone but without much success for now. Um, and I guess what this did for me was somehow hint at that. And I think maybe that's the reason why I was so troubled by it. Because that's exactly what takes us out. I mean, at least what I feel took me out. Maybe I will modulate that a little bit afterwards. You might feel out oh, it's a bit too harsh and a bit too black and white. And I think it is a bit too black and white. So we'll look at it. But, but yeah, that was kind of the initial hunch on that. Becoming a translator, what does that mean? Um, this is basically what Asli uh, Sonseli uh, says is the role of the artist and she wrote uh, the artist manifesto, uh, the manifesto of the solastalgic artist, where she basically says our role as artists or the way she sees her role as artist is to act as a translator for mother nature in a way. And she does that through performances, through uh, different things that may be considered contemporary art or not. Um, but in any case, this would be the idea of not like just reflecting what's happening to nature, but trying to reconnect. And I would say that's exactly where this exhibition sits, at least based on the video that's normally playing here. It's really like, how can I feel myself back into this thing that's not separate from me or that shouldn't be separate from me, but it somehow has become separate from me. And I'm still trying to, to get my mouse back here. <laughs> Good. Um, and arguably, in a way, um, that's what Lois Weinberger also tries to do, like giving an image of reconnecting with this image of holding Earth and offering a possible image of let's say, um, caring relationship, right? So offering alternative images. Now, if these images have destroyed a lot, maybe we can find alternative images to rebuild something of that relationship. If images really do, as I argued, create a relationship to nature implicitly, now maybe alternative images, images of care, could, could help move us in a different direction. And in a way, there's another thing done by an artist which is a way of caring and in this case it's really camouflaging. It's Jenny Kendler who makes these camouflage birds. We showed them around an image of the Noah's Ark in the Fragile Creation exhibition that, that look pretty much like that where she basically camouflages creating allegories of a way of protecting these animals from the human gaze. Because, you know, we like to have these birds at home represented, or we used to. We have all these little representations, as long as they don't shit anywhere, you know. And so it's kind of also a criticism of, of this relationship of nature as something to be looked at and enjoyed. Uh, and so she creates these ways of hiding the birds again, um, maybe also trying to, to, yeah, argue for a new relationship. And that's something the Gadamer says is that art can go sometimes maybe beyond representing. The work of art can hopefully signify an increase in being. When I first read that, I felt, you know, that this was kind of wacko metaphysics and I didn't, I found it like, you know, I, I didn't believe in it. I, I was too much of a rationalist, too much analytic to believe that, um, to think like Adam or that art could do something that he said we were told happens with the hostie in, uh, what, what do you call it, hostie, uh, the thing in church, you know, that 
is transformed into blood and the wine is transformed into blood and this is transformed into bread is transformed into the body of Christ. And he says somehow art does that, augmenting reality. And mimesis here, of course, does not mean imitating something already known, but bringing something to representation. And lately I have thought that maybe, maybe some art does that and this is something that will, will ring a bell with at least two people in the room. And maybe Hana Uzui, a Japanese artist, Black Rain does something like that. It was made for Hiroshima and, and Fukushima, but it was, it was made after the disaster with the power plant in, in Japan recently. And here it's really an image that works that destroys the image. It's an image of the destruction of the image. So here you see the display where you would normally show destroying. What it tries to represent is so strong that it even makes it impossible to represent. It destroys the image alongside with these burn marks. And um, so maybe on this, it's a very small work. It looks very big here, but it's that size. She achieves something here of conveying as far as you can convey something like that, the destruction of a nuclear, nuclear blast where art basically, of course, also would be gone, but where you have this feeling of something you can't contain. You can't just make an image like Warhol of a, of a, a, a mushroom, you know, and then you've made an image of nuclear destruction. The mushroom is not and it, it has become that because we know what it is, but it's probably a less adequate image of what it actually means than this image where you can actually smell the burn of this plexiglass and, and so on and so forth, which becomes a multi-sensorial experience as well and, and kind of hints at the totality of, of, such, of such a destruction. Um, and these for me also somehow have this idea of augmenting reality um, and you know finding ways to represent something that go beyond just having a picture of it. Well, yeah I'll now move to the digital realm because imagining future traces for some reason also has to do for a lot of artists with imagining digital traces. Traces we leave behind not so much in the physical world but in the digital world. There are older examples of future traces imagined. Of course, this would be a good, good example, right? In Planet of the Apes, in the final scene, where you discover that the Planet of the Apes is actually Planet Earth. So here an artist has imagined uh, a physical trace. But in a video game like, like this one, uh, everybody uh, has gone to the rapture from 2015, you kind of have the idea of a trace that has become somewhat electronic. And this is a, it's a fantasy of the world being somehow erased because people start disappearing into, into pure energy. And it's really a trace-based narrative that exists for PlayStation, where you walk through this English village and try to figure out what happened based on the traces. Um, so where people just exist to this hologrammatic, in this hologrammatic form um, have turned into some kind of spiritual beings. And there's a very old, I mean not very old, 20th century text by um, a Latin American writer that's called uh, L'Invention de Morel, The Invention of Morel. I don't know if you know that, it's like someone goes to an island and there are these specters and anyway, I don't want to do a spoiler, but there's an, an earlier version of that, which some people have connected to photography. But this is kind of the, the playable version, in a sense, with traces that we need to read. And there are two works that I find particularly strong in this regard and I wish I could have experienced the VR experience. Uh, done by them is Pierre, by Pierre Alain Giraud and Antoine Viviani. And the idea is that by the time we all die, our data will still haunt the digital world. And somewhere in the data centers, there will still be our messages from WhatsApp and, 
you know, they will be running around and, and all the videos and the cat videos that we uploaded and maybe the speeches and, and so In Limbo is, is a film on these basically have total recall. So that's, that's just a trailer of that film, of course, and um, yeah, it's really a, a, a representation of, I think, this idea of disappearance and what could re remain afterwards. And based on this first thought, they created a, a second experience, which is actually called Solastalgia. And it's a VR experience where you walk into a room with physical objects um, and experience encounters with different people who have been there before. The ambience is somewhat similar, but it's really the idea that the last generations of humans have become digital ghosts that haunt the planet and different times overlay. So you might have a tree, uh, a tree that one time was there and you have a person talking about the tree, but then in the next scene you have a person talking at the same spot but a tree is gone and so on so it's it's really like playing with this idea of the digital trace which might or might not be a replacement for the experience we're living now um, and you can also watch the trailer I won't play it now for time reasons um, now to the nearly last chapter, which is about the idea that maybe art might be a place to somehow compensate or even heal. And um, there's this song by, by Denise Soyarslan, um, where she thinks, sings to the earth, um, which is a kind of practice where art borders shamanism a little bit. So a lot of these practices sh somehow have this idea of the artist shaman, um, which we also know from, from Joseph Beuys, maybe is also somewhat present in Marina Abramovic and, and some more, more famous artists, but really with this idea of um, reconnecting and finding ways to, to heal. Um, and there was a whole exhibition in Australia that was done around the theme of going to see communities that had suffered 
their habitat disappeared, had suffered this homesickness while at home. Um, where, for instance, this work by Melinda Lang Young was made, uh, which is a way to kind of combine nature. And she worked with a, in a place where the bushfires in Australia had destroyed everything. So this kind of omni-destruction and uh, used found wood and then human elements to rebuild something like, you know, an image of, of what is gone. And of course, within this realm, we could also think of Thomas Cole. It's like recreating this wild scene from before in art. But these are not necessarily direct interventions on nature. Um, but some artists do, like Louis Weinberger, who made this work, uh, very often made works where he basically replanted plants that were gone or went in to the outside and, and uh, preserved, for instance, plants that were, would normally have been taken down because they're considered weeds, they're considered bad plants. What means to be a bad plant that humans can't use it. We can't eat it, we can't use it to heal ourselves. It's a bad weed. It's just another plant. Of course, there's invasive species, but not all weeds are invasive species, what we call a, a Unkraut in German. It's a, a, a an weed, yeah? it's, it's, actually, uh, it's actually just a plant that's not useful to humans or that we don't know how it's useful to us in any case. And so here he stands, as he says, in support of the events which are generally called nature. And I love the title because we, and I have been doing that in my talk, we can very easily presuppose that it's a given what nature is and what culture is. But here he says, no, it's just a bunch of events that we call nature to delimit it from another bunch of events. So it's the constructedness of our image of what nature is uh, totally goes already in the title. And here he's putting out a, a plant again in the, in the wild. And another way of offering alternative approaches would be the Serpent River book by Carolina Caicedo as well, which is a book around different approaches to the river. So the river as a resource, of course, the river as something that can be dammed. So this is around how they made California uh, a livable place by uh, damming the Colorado River, um, but also more indigenous approaches to the river, um, where the river is a person and what that implies. So looking at other cultures, has also been a way for artists and non-artists to find different ways to approach um, nature and maybe try to unscrew what we screwed up, uh, if that's even possible. And also, um, so one way would be looking into a past, right? So that's what we did sometimes, looking into a past where the relationship was different with these images from early Christianity, for instance, but then also looking into other cultures like the Andoke, uh, having a relationship where you have the cyclical image or in this case, you know, uh, the, uh, some, some of the people in, in Latin America having this relationship to nature as people, as their human peoples and their mountain peoples and river peoples. And, and this, of course, induces a very different way, a different ontology, different way of thinking what there is uses a different way of interacting. So now I'm coming near the end of my talk with actually maybe another way of solving the issue. And it's in the kind of bio biography of this talk, I initially thought of that as another dystopian kind of future scenario. It's, uh, it's no man's sky. And the gamers and those who are interested in gaming might know this this game No Man's Sky is basically a game that's famous because it has an infinite amount of planets that are all generated while you play. So they are not pre-coded. There's a number of things that could be in a planet, a number of animals, a number of species and so on. And so this gives billions of combinations. So you can actually play a computer game at home and discover new worlds that no one else has seen before. And in a way, I think it is actually a compensation. Like it's a way to say, okay, our world goes to the shambles. 
now we create a digital world which is full of beauty and and there's one way to see this game really as a game with a story and missions um, that you have to accomplish as you play it which is basically the way they present it here So here, the first part is kind of this kind of this covering aspect, right? And the second part is really the gameplay, the mission, this, this whole thing that gamers uh, like. But what's sometimes interesting when you look into games is looking into how the fans basically um, have received it. And uh, here is a fan video uh, from, from this film. Uh, from this from this game and what you'll discover here is that this is really not playing the game so much for the story not even for the mission that you accomplish because usually these are the two poles that people oppose either you're a gamer whose story interest in storytelling or the mission but for exploring the world so this is really about exploring a story world. And then there's a bit of flying around and so on. But the last video this person made um, brings in something completely different. And I hadn't expected that to happen. Um, but maybe it's the most interesting part in this digital world. And that's what I'll uh, really end it with, is um, this video that he made before he said he wouldn't do any videos anymore because of technical reasons, basically, but that's not, um, it's not so important. Let me see if I can get this to run. Yes.
And reading the comment really brought home to me that there was something completely new happening with this kind of game world. Because one person said, your video, your video gave me back the feeling that I had when I was first playing this game. So I thought at first this was purely a replacement for living in our world. But what's happening here is that people are now experiencing a solastasia of a place that is purely digital. So they want to go back to this place and they have the feeling that it's gone and that these moments are gone and this layover, this voice makes that clear in that video, right? Which is of course taken from the first Blade Runner movie. I've seen things and so on. I've seen things, but the things I've seen, I haven't seen in the fucking real world. I've seen them in the game and they will forever be gone. Um, and yeah, so this was my ride for you today um, around these notions, storytelling, traces, what might be the trace we leave behind and all the way to this digital version of Solastasia that kind of seems to appear with video games. Would be very happy to have a dialogue uh, if you still have some force for that, thanks.